Janelle Blankenship, notre autre invitée, euh, est de l'Université Western Ontario à London. Euh, elle va nous présenter une communication intitulée « Marketing and Managing the Flow of Images, the Combination Lantern Scope ». Janelle Blankenship is Associate Professor of Film Studies at the University of Western Ontario and a member of the Dumtor Society for the Study of Early Cinema. Uh, the Magic Lan Lantern Society of the United Kingdom and also Magic Lantern Society of the United States and Canada. She has published on Magic Lantern culture, early v German cinema and avant-garde silent cinema and has co-edited the anthology European Visions, Small Cinemas in Transition. She is now completing a book on Magic Lantern, showman and film pioneer Max Slag Skladanowski and is also cataloging a new collection of lantern slides and ephemera from Sla Skladan sorry, Skladanowski, <laughs> former estate in Franca at the German Technical Museum. I let them talk. The Magic Lantern panel continues, uh, and I will be speaking today on the combination lantern scope, and the collection has approximately 65% of uh, of the collection is uh, a, an artifact from this this uh, technical history, the combination lantern scope. So uh, in 1896, in the Optical Magic Lantern Journal, we read the present boom as regards the lantern appears to be in the direction of animated projection. Some time ago, we tried free screens apparatus, but lately quite a host have arisen. The, combina the combined lantern appeared also as a spectacular device in the supplemental section on the cinematograph in Paul and Husluck's optical lantern and accessories, how to make and manage them. Husluck boasts that the projection of so-called animated photographs has given lantern work a new lease on life. Husluck quips that combined lanterns and machines used for this work vary in construction and are known by many names. The machine he describes is but typical of many. The name cinematograph seems the most popular term. Here are a few selected uh, terms for such devices, and um, I'm going to give you a brief history of uh, several of these apparatuses. So my history goes beyond uh, 1914 or 1915. It goes into the 20s as well. So I'd also, also like to give a kind of prehistory and just uh, select one device that I think is, is uh, intriguing uh, in terms of um, modular, flexible systems. Uh, and uh, film is part of a, uh, a larger, um, what I would call intertwined history of exhibition, technology, uh, spectatorship, uh, and, um, and uh, this is the combination lecture lantern by Hughes, as pictured in the Scientific American Supplement. So showmen and optical manufacturers such as Hughes promoted the use of combination lanterns prior to the advent of living pictures. As early as 1888, as described in an issue of the Scientific American Supplement, Hughes devised a lecture lantern mounted on metal rollers with the special object of facilitating the change of images thrown on the screen. A lecturer could, by means of this combined lantern, rapidly bring before his audience first a general view of the object, next some detail, and thirdly, an enlarged microscopic view of any part, simply by turning the lantern on its vertical axis or exhibit different stages in a chemical or physical experiment uh, in quick succession. So this could be an optical, uh, what's, what's called a megascope or an opaque lantern, uh, or it could be used to also project transparent slides. And we have several examples in our collection as well um, uh, of, of the combination um, opaque and transparent lantern. So through the lens of late 19th century and early 20th century combination lantern scopes, we might see film exhibition practices as part of a more modular and flexible showman system. One is not only constantly tweaking, engineering, and improving devices, but also reusing, recycling images and parts, and simultaneously creating a more continuous flow of images for the spectator. So instead of thinking of moving picture media and magic lantern projection as distinct trajectories or histories, we need to reconfigure the two, uh, borrowing from Ian's uh, metaphor, shaking the film history kaleidoscope, viewing film and lantern projection as intertwined and fused exhibition histories and cultural practices. 
So I, I, I would like to argue that the case study of the combined lantern scope really invites us to uh, uh, fuse media and confuse our vision for a moment, uh, asking us to see double. Uh, we see multiple inventors, multiple parts, multiple uh, patents, instrument, ma instrument makers, operators, exhibitors, multiple formats, parallel histories, dual histories, or dissolving histories unfold. So uh, to start off the intertwined history, uh, I would like to reference uh, two showmen, uh, Cecil Hepworth and uh, his father, Thomas, um, Thomas Hepworth. And, and they exhibited also together at the National Photographic and Allied Trade Exhibition in 1898. Cecil Hepworth was managing the entertainment division, arranging his entertainment to follow out the policy that he'd already successfully pursued, stringing living pictures together in some definite arrangement with the help of interspersed lantern slides from his own negative collection, one virtually leading up to the next. And his father, uh, Thomas Hepworth, also exhibited lantern lectures in this uh, entertainment division program. Uh, Hepworth, Cecil Hepworth, the filmmaker son, who was also a lanternist and uh, uh, he experienced his first projection. Uh, he, he, he talks fondly about the sitting on the steps of the London Polytechnic, uh, and that's how he grew up with the, with the, with the lantern. Um, so uh, wouldn't, wouldn't we all like that after this, to go to the <laughs> steps of the Polytechnic? Uh, he wrote the first article on the combination lantern scope uh, in 1897 on some com combinations of lantern and cinematograph in the British Journal of Photography. Uh, and and Cecil, uh, Cecil Hepworth argues that a living photograph show as an entertainment is a very good thing, but it has its disadvantages. The instrument now by common consent, almost always called the cinematograph, uh, for to learn the individual name of each machine is beyond the power of mortal man, is generally expensive to begin with. And the films too, the animated pictures represent a matter of over three pounds each, and they are by no means everlasting. The amount of light that is required is many times that which would be ample for an ordinary lantern show. And owing to the somewhat complex nature of the manipulations inseparably associated with this kind of entertainment, it is almost essential to a fair prospect of success that there should be two operators in attendance. But it is not with the drawbacks to cinematographic cinematograph entertainments from the pro provider and producer's point of view that I would wish to deal, but rather with a few of its inconsistencies as observable by the audience and with some of the methods that have been from time to time adopted to improve them. So Hepworth uh, promoted a continuous uh, program, much like the lecture uh, Lanternous Homes, uh, Charlie, Charlie Musser describes this continuous program. So stringing together images in, as part of a continuous program. Uh, and on his itinerant circle, he recycled used films from R.W. Paul's junk basket that were available for a few, few shillings. These throwouts or cheap films um, were the basis of his um, multimedia performance. Um, and he also added to this uh, moving image experience his own negatives. So hundreds of lantern slides from his own negatives accumulated over several years. He grouped these slides into a few short series, having a story content, and then fertilized the slides by combining them with suitable films from said junk basket, built up with lecture and music, and taken all over the country to halls where many in the audience had never seen a living photograph before. Hepworth fondly remembers one little series which always went down very well indeed, uh, called The Storm, which consisted of half a dozen slides and, four, and one 40-foot film. The sequence opened with a calm and peaceful picture of sea and sky, soft and gentle music that changed to another seascape, th though the clouds looked a little more interesting, and the music quickened a bit. At each change, the inevitability of a coming gale became more insistent and the music more threatening until the storm broke with an exciting film of dashing waves bursting into the entrance of a cave with wild music. I did the commentary, of course, as well as working the lanterns and films. So the combination lantern scopes, we often think of them as side by side. We often, uh, the terms primary versus secondary are also used in the lantern catalogs um, um, to, to describe the switch over. And, uh, and, and it's uh, uh, certainly the case that the cinematograph starts off as a supplement, but very soon the magic lantern completes the show and it becomes the supplement and the complement. Uh, and it, it also perfects 
the film experience. So, um, and looking at ways uh, in which these uh, these um, these combined lantern scopes are arranged, uh, and often it takes its cue from dissolving view by unial lanterns to optical systems. Um, and Hepworth has one particular uh, model that he finds uh, fascinating, which is Wrench, who took a triunial lantern and he took the bottom uh, uh, optical system out and he put in a cinematographic device. So the cinematographic device literally took uh, uh, the part of the final triunial um, optical system. So the lantern, in a sense, provided technical solutions to a series of problems that had been posed by the cinemat cinematograph. Uh, and what was key for Hepworth and also for Hughes was how to fill in the gap or interval between one picture and the next in managing the flow of images. Ultimately, the slide was used as an announcement slide. So the slide filled in the gap in this, in this way. But uh, earlier with Hepworth's itinerant uh, uh, performances, the slide was more than just an announcement. Um, it was an aesthetic experience that completed and continued the, the motion picture um, performance. And another statement about early filmmaking entitled Those Were the Days, Hepworth recalls how before he even dreamed of making picture, pictures, he bought a terrible mechanism for a guinea, fitted it to a limelight lantern, and with half a dozen thrown out 40-foot films of Paul and about 100 lantern slides toured the country and gave an hour and a half's entertainment in church rooms, mechanic institutes, and the like. Uh, unlike Paul's cinematograph and larger machines that he references in his 1951 memoir as big clumsy machines, he describes his own combination lantern scope as a portable little machine, uh, which he just set up on a, on a table in the middle of the room. So there's kind of uh, an interesting way in which uh, the audience is kind of also interacting with this technology and it's positioned in the middle of the room and it invites that kind of modular thinking, interactive um, user a hands-on laboratory experience. So as Hepworth uh, writes, a cinematograph projector is in essence nothing but an ordinary optical or magic lantern with the mechanism fitted in front of the slide carrier. Um, but we know that it's, it's, uh, it's also more than that. Uh, amongst the many houses devoted to the lantern trade, perhaps none is more popular than that presided over by Mr. W.C. Hughes. The premises, uh, according to the Lantern and Cinematograph Journal in 1904, uh, were packed with everything pertinent to the lantern industry. And a point that uh, recommends this establishment is Mr. Hughes is a specialist and expert with over 30 years practical experience. So what does Hughes have to say also about managing the flow of images and what devices did Hughes patent uh, and did, did Hughes um, uh, 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 market and, and, uh, and produce? Hughes produced the rotograph, the combination lantern and scope, which was um, advertised as a perfect, producing perfect alternating pictures. And he also patented the reversing bio pictoroscope, which was combined with a, a lantern and pr could produce colored scenic effects. So it had a tinter, so it tinted the film during projection. So it actually used lantern uh, tinting technology to tint the film. So again, uh, lantern technology is perfecting and completing uh, the film performance or film experience. So I have one review of the bio pictoroscope that I couldn't resist including. <laughs> it is impossible in one review uh, to include all the specialties on view, but we draw attention to Hughes' patent combination lantern and bio pict pictoroscope, an illustration of which we append. Among its many distinctive features may be mentioned the registering of film in a film cage and tinting film whilst running. The optical systems are absolutely perfect. Two sets of condensers are employed and the reverser is fitted with separate piston plungers, making reversing and non-reversing instantaneous and certain. These are a few of the many advantages of this machine. So Hughes also uh, in, his, um, in his 1904 catalog includes this street cinematograph. Um, the Bayou, <laughs> and uh, this is also um, using uh, a, a lantern um, as a kind of peep, peep show uh, projection, but it's larger images than the kinetoscope, so that's the kind of. So the lantern scope uh, was embedded in a discourse on modernity, on visual fatigue, uh, and 
and um, there's a new art of accelerated images. At the same time, showmen and exhibitors um, are often emphasizing the need to um, slow the image down, um, the need to mitigate distraction uh, in the theater to um, uh, are warning us of uh, the uh, dangers of darkness. Um, so it was important to think about a f facilitating a flickerless film experience uh, and, and, um, and, and making sure spectators are not faced or confronted with an empty interval or the black moment on the screen. So Huslek in his supplemental section on the cinematograph and his optical lantern, Manual cautions that it is particularly difficult to keep the inter audience entertained while placing fresh film in the instrument. Of course, to keep the constant flow of images or attractions, it was desirable to have an auxiliary lantern ready for the projection or ordinary slides with which to fill the time. And Hepworth writes that the rapid changeover from lantern slide to film without notes noticeable interview is one of the essential conditions of good showmanship in a show of this kind. The, the interval was also part of a discourse, again, on these nauseating, flickering shadows uh, that could be also linked to shutters. For other manufacturers such as Hughes, who himself uh, produced several alternating apparatuses, including the machines already seen, the rotograph and the combination lantern and biopictoscope, the shutters were the culprit, causing flickering shadows that led to sickness, nausea, and headache. In his 1897 notes, a little information about the cinematograph, Hughes argues that people will come again and again to see these living pictures, so to speak, projected on a screen in a realistic manner, full of animation and light. The writer and others are never tired of looking at them when a shutterless machine is used, but they are distracted by the flickering of the dark shadows that is cast over the pictures by most shutter machines. So um, he argues that most machines have shutters to close out each picture during each stage of movement, but unfortunately, they cause a great amount of flickering, which is very distressing to the eye, and will often cause this sickness and headache. Um, a, a nauseating, flickering uh, effect uh, in, indeed leads to the audience becoming wearied and tired of the performance. So he even complains that combination projection machines and cameras could cause anxiety, since they often include shutters. So he argues during the change of film, it is better to interject an art picture either from a separate projecting lantern or alternately in the machine itself fitted with such an, uh, such an arrangement because it is unwise to leave an audience in darkness. Neither is it desirable to give them the full glare of light from the body of the hall. So what were previously tedious waits are turned into entertaining reviews also um, of pictorial advertisements uh, using the early kind of announcement slides um, in, uh, uh, in lantern screen practice. This gives uh, a, a, a chance for operators to rest, but it also, according to these manuals, is a welcome pause and kind of um, uh, offers a kind of contemplative pause for the spectator and allows them to rest their eyes. Okay, so uh, here we have um, a few uh, of these devices. And I'm going to start with Lubin's cineograph. Um, and Lubin's uh, cineographs, first cineographs were likely made with the assistance of Francis Jenkins uh, and were copies of the Fantascope lateral projector. Uh, the 1897 model weighed 11 pounds, um, but the cast iron stand weighed 31 pounds, so I don't know if it's really portable. <laughs> Uh, in comparison, uh, the Sears and Roebuck optograph was a six pound attachment to the Magic Lantern. Um, and in the 20s, there were many lighter models such as the Keystone movie graph, which only weighed four pounds. So Lubin's cineograph combined with the stereopticon, um, the advertisements prominently picture the slide carrier. Uh, and this isn't the case in a lot of later advertisements in the teens and the 20s the slide carrier is um, either put to the side or not visible. And it's the primary uh, moving picture, the film is primary moving picture that's advertised. So this is also sold frequently as a complete outfit. So with six films, for example, and three uh, slides. This is the underwriter approved model and uh, his catalog, 1906 catalog, also includes slide 
uh, uh, paraphernalia, slide carriers, um, uh, carrying cases for the combined lantern scopes. He also sells lenses, stereopticon lenses. Uh, and here's a German uh, advert for the, uh, for the, for the cineograph um, from 1904. And this is a German toy projector uh, by the Nuremberg Producers Manufacturers Brothers Bing, uh, Cinematograph and Magic Lantern, which has been reproduced in many other catalogs uh, from that same time period. Uh, Oskar Mester and Skladnovsky both offered this device for sale in their own optical um, price lists. And they also offered the Ernst Planck Kinemit door, not identifying the maker, of course, um, but this is a wonderful device that also is in the collection um, with uh, glass um, moving picture discs. And um, the advertisement reads, an apparatus for projecting uh, moving, ap ap apparently moving pictures at the same time a magic lantern. So this is Mester's catalog with the two um, devices uh, advertised. Uh, and Skladinovsky's uh, catalog offers the, um, the kinematograph for basically half price. <laughs> so he has a very different audience. This is another image from Mester's catalog, the, the travel kinetograph. And um, for um, Paul, I had to include the <laughs> carrying case here. And uh, of course, Mester would still sell um, in 1897 um, a large, um, he had a large number of slides um, and, and slide carriers and slide um, ephemera that he would, he would um, sell. Skladnovsky's catalog uh, from 1898 has these same devices. So the next device is a Riley Brothers kinetoscope. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> that's funny. The best of all cinematographs. And um, in, in this case, the cinematograph mechanism actually goes into the slide carrier. So this is the most unique uh, combination lantern scope I have found. Uh, 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 and um, uh, yeah, quite unique. It, 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 it plugs into the slide, ca slide carrier as if it were a slide itself. Um, Lisa Gang in Dusseldorf uh, also had a um, a large, uh, very large uh, inventory of slides, over 15,000 slides in, in, uh, in the teens. Uh, and, and Lisa Gang also distributed many combination lantern scopes, manufactured these also. Uh, and here, triunial lantern with the cinematograph, biunial lantern with the cinematograph. Uh, and I'd like to, I just included this image from Hagedorn's theater apparatus, um, manufacturing um, workshops, so it's a moving picture laboratory, but it's a, it's a, um, it's a, uh, uh, it's a showroom, uh, showroom as moving picture laboratory, because I think these intertwined histories, I think it's very important to think about also spectatorship as part of these intertwined histories, and here the hands-on experience testing the technology, and uh, indeed the probasal is the, is the kind of screening room that's open to the public in the back, where you can go test out these technologies and you can see it's partially in the, in the wonderful woodcut, partially that you get the kind of it inviting, uh, the invitation to join us in the throne room with the curtains in the back. Uh, so Lisa Gang's catalog, um, catalogs um, give us a wonderful history of the combination uh, lantern scopes uh, in, in Germany around uh, from, from 1900 to 1915. And he also argues for uh, dissolving views, like a revival of dissolving views, using dissolving view lantern practice with uh, cinematographic projection. Um, and uh, again, going back to those same arguments about visual fatigue and distraction so that the dissolving views could provide a kind of welcome contemplative respite for spectators. Um, he gives us uh, in his catalogs fascinating um, uh, how-tos for to the act of combining these, these two media. Um, and um, here we have a little section on the cinematograph and dissolving views. Um, the dissolving view screen practice is especially suited to complement the cinematograph. And here his, his um, performance piece, Flying Through the World, 
uh, using a biennial device and a cinematograph. And there were devices um, also made in Nuremberg that combined gramophone and sound technology, of course, with the combined lantern scope. And this is one of those devices, the Kinograph phone. So um, also in the Magic Lantern catalogs and Bing's catalogs, you could find um, phonographic records and slides and films for this outfit. It was a quite expensive outfit, though. I don't think there are so many children who are getting these for their mother. <laughs> we think of the Nuremberg production as toy uh, toy tin toy objects, tin toy cinematographs. But indeed, this is often going a little bit beyond just the uh, uh, amateur home use. Uh, you can see that they have uh, some uh, theatrical uh, exhibition as well. So uh, the Ernemann Kinopticon uh, from 1920. Uh, it's a school cinematograph uh, equipped with lantern sides. This is a wonderful image by a German poster artist, Ludwig Holbein. Um, and uh, it shows actually uh, interesting that it markets this also for girls um, because frankly uh, going forward you don't see uh, many girls in these advertisements uh, it's normally a boy operating the device uh, and maybe girls are in the audience uh, a mother in the audience uh, even earlier you often see uh, uh, lanterns advertised using young boys So the Keystone movie graph uh, in uh, one advertisement argues that it's the standard of the world for boys and girls, but it's never, <laughs> it's never a girl. <laughs> in fact, um, uh, some of the advertisements really play up the boyish nature of this device. Uh, um, oh boy, some sport. Uh, and, and then it goes on and on about um, how this could enhance your boyish childhood experience. Um, that Keystone movie graph was interesting because they distributed Chaplin uh, excerpts. So um, they, uh, they had 100 foot excerpts from the Chaplin Keystones and they were using safety film. And they also distributed slides and accessories. Um, the advertisements argued that it was completely easy to use, a regular beauty all complete, ready for you to use the minute it arrives, hang on a sheet, put on a reel, turn the crank, and you're off. That's all there is to it, equipped to show slides and real moving pictures, just like the big machines. Shows the same films that big theater use. The film is the same size as used in the theaters. Shows big size moving pictures. Here you see Chaplin. So uh, the movie graph projector was sometimes also sold um, as a gimmick, it was sold for free, but you actually had to um, sell picture postcards and then send the money in. <laughs> and then uh, once you sent them the $7 and sold your picture postcards, you could get your device and the complete outfit, including uh, ex three extra long standard size films, three fine slides and emission tickets. So the uh, Keystone Company also invented a flashlight movie lantern in 1922, uh, a flashlight instead of a house current was used as a light source with a dry cell battery. And the toy motion picture machines were sold with lantern slides, movie tickets, operator badges, etc. Now the slides, the nature of slides at this point has changed or shifted somewhat. The slides that are sold by Keystone um, in 1922 are you draw on slides or film compartment slides. So children could make their own lantern slide out of old pieces of film. In essence, their technology was, was not perfect. And they often tore the film during projection. So children could take the torn film and create a slide. Um, so in a, in, a, in a sense, it kind of made, again, perfected kind of the imperfect machine. So this is the advertisement for the Keystone flashlight movies. One uh, moving picture machine. Two magic lantern, three flashlight, <laughs> all in one. You see the slides advertised uh, in the image, but they're to the side. They're just uh, here's an operator badge. So uh, the the trade publication Toys and Novelties. Uh, uh, 
that published this. Ben Marks is pleased as punch over his new motion picture machine for flashlight movies. The machine uses regulation film and is operated with an ordinary flashlight battery. It is bound to appeal to the restless youth who delights in doing trick stunts as the boy can run all over the house, carry the small outfit, and still be showing pictures on the ceiling, the walls, or any light surface. <laughs> so here there's distraction, no problem. <laughs> Take this machine, run. Yeah. <laughs> so they also make the, um, make the comment that there's a, a laboratory that they develop their own films. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to... This is another movie graph. So there are patents, and I found two patents for the movie graph. Um, 1920 um, and uh, 1922. Uh, the, the first patent, um, the inventor was Isidore Marx, and the second patent was uh, inventor Edward, Edward M. Schwartz. Um, and uh, a new film guide and other improvements aimed to overcome some of the feeding difficulties and make it easier to thread the film so you didn't quite have as much breakage, but you still wanted to do those film compartment slides, I assume. <laughs> so here we have a few more advertisements, and I just wanted to end uh, with um, the idea of instruments as inspiration. Uh, inspiration for collectors, inspiration for f filmmakers, and the movie graph uh, has indeed inspired uh, many uh, filmmakers and collectors. And this is one, uh, one account um, of a filmmaker who discusses how he, modulate, he uh, modified the machine. Uh, he put on extension arms so he could see a thousand foot reels of 35 millimeter film, okay, because it was only um, uh, able to project uh, 25 feet or 100 feet of 35 millimeter film, so he put extension arms on. Uh, and he says, thus equipped, I could set my sights in acquiring and showing whole feature films instead of the inadequate little excerpts. Around the neighborhood were other Keystone movie graph owners. Collections began by swapping one's less and favorite item for those of fellow collectors. And um, that's a note I wanted to end on. Thank you. I'm very curious about this idea of time and space that happens with the, the control or the performance of the lanternist. I'm more curious about, um, I, I am very curious about that, but I'm, I'm specifically curious about this gendered idea that comes into play um, and how not only were, were projectors or magic lanterns marketed to girls, what was marketed to girls, but if there's any research on how there's, if there is a gender difference in how um, the use of the lanterns played out, um, literally playing with them. Um, yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> um, this is uh, kind of a new area of research. Uh, there were women, of course, who uh, were itinerant projectionists and women who were operating, um, uh, operating projectors, women, women in projectionist unions, obviously. Um, uh, already in the Magic Lantern era, there were uh, women also operating the machine. Um, but in terms of advertising um, and um, visualizing uh, that, um, uh, women were primarily pictured as spectators. Um, and, uh, the, uh, yeah, they, they're, they're one of the first, uh, uh, performances of the cinematograph in Europe was, uh, Annette Teufel, uh, actually a very kind of little known fact, uh, uh, a woman who was a chanson singer, um, uh, who, who did present, a, a, a Lumiere cinematograph in, uh, in Sweden, um, but, um, it's a really kind of an unknown history. There's uh, little research on that. Uh, and um, in terms of playing projection and kind of marketing, there were, there were toys, um, construction model kits, cardboard lanterns, and they were almost always marketed for boys. And I haven't found um, many, with a few rare exceptions, I haven't found many um, uh, toy and novelty books for girls that um, have the, the, the as many devices. There may be a few key, a few just token devices, um, but a, a boy's um, 
a, a, a boys construction set would have um, three or four times as many. So um, it was just not seen, that of course it was a sewing kits and, and that kind of thing, right? Um, so it, it, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, I, I find it quite interesting too. Um, and there's just little research done on that. Mm -hmm. D'autres curieux? Vous avez tous faim? Moi aussi, c'est pas bien. Bon, ben écoutez, euh, si on est vraiment à court de parole, euh, mieux vaut aller se sustenter. Alors, merci. Oui, François? À propos du cinéographe que 